call the House Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee uh, back to order. Uh, thank you, members, for jumping on. Obviously, much later than we intended, but hopefully we can get through these last two bills and uh, we can all get on with our evenings. Uh, first up, we have uh, Representative Pinto's bill, House File 1942. I will, recommend, I will move that House File 1942 be recommended to be placed on the General Register. Uh, Representative Pinto, your bill is now before us. Please go ahead and tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure to be with you and, uh, and the committee. Um, I served on this committee a couple terms ago and really glad to be back um, with you all. So uh, the bill before you members um, makes a, uh, a change relating to, um, to birth records, uh, and it uh, connects with a, um, a program called the, uh, the College Savings Accounts um, that have been operated by the City of St. Paul. This is a program that allows, um, uh, that uh, supports families when they have a new baby, um, put some money into an account, and research has shown that it can make a really big difference, and a surprisingly big difference in outcomes for that child. We heard this proposal in the House Early Childhood Committee, which I chair, uh, and it received uh, support there. Uh, and there is an issue, though, with um, making sure that uh, families uh, can have uh, the enrollment that will allow them to be supported in this. Um, I'm going to turn things to the testifier to kind of explain, if I can, uh, what exactly is needed, and then we'll, uh, we'll we'll go from there. But I think that uh, Manir Karkar Ramos from uh, City of St. Paul is here, and so if we can call on him, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, if you could introduce yourself and then go ahead with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Munir Karcher Ramos, and I'm the Director of the Office of Financial Empowerment with the City of St. Paul. I'm here today before you to testify in support of House File uh, 1942. Um, there should be a, a handout posted um, as well, um, and I'll be making reference to that uh, throughout uh, my testimony here briefly. So uh, I have running kids around upstairs, uh, so uh, excuse me if you hear stomping. Uh, just over a year ago, on January 1st, 2020, the City of St. Paul launched College Bound St. Paul, a citywide uh, children's savings account program starting at birth. Um, on the handout provided, you'll see treme uh, the tremendous body of research that has been conducted on small dollar savings accounts. For example, research showed that low to moderate income children who have between one to $499 in a college savings account are three times more likely to go to college and four times more likely to graduate. Other research have showed reductions in maternal depression, increases in child social emotional development, and higher uh, parental aspirations for their children's future. Uh, this research is undeniable, and the, re uh, the reason why the city of St. Paul cannot pass up the opportunity to launch uh, children's savings account program in our city. The children's savings account programs across the country use uh, public birth record information to auto enroll children into programs. Uh, in our first year, the city enrolled uh, just over 3,000 children who were born in 2020, but we could have enrolled close to 4,700 children if we didn't run into issues with public birth record information. Uh, the state of Minnesota passed a policy back at the turn of uh, you know, in the early 1900s uh, that made birth records uh, confidential for children born to mothers who are not married. In other words, what the impact is today is the city could not open a, a children's savings account for about 1,600 children um, in our first year because of this confidential birth record provision. Um, the, this bill is asking the state legislature to create an exemption for children's savings accounts to have access to certain birth record information. Um, in an existing statute, a birth records um, exemption does exist um, for family and children collaboratives um, providing services to young children. Uh, the city is asking for a comparable exemption um, for our children's savings account program as well. Having this information will allow us to fully enroll children in the CSA program. If you look at the chart on our handout, this policy would increase access to uh, the children's savings account program by about 16,000 participants over the next 10 years or about uh, 1,600 babies uh, per year. In other words, passing this bill ensure an additional 60,000 children could have investment in a small dollar account that significantly increases their likelihood to attend and graduate college and have many other um, effects. With that, I'll conclude my uh, testimony and Dan, for any questions. All right, thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative Pinto. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and just before we go to, to questions, I just wanted to make sure um, that uh, the members are aware um, that information, the default uh, for these records is that they be public information. It's not in the language of the bill, it's in the, the statute, the subdivision one, just before subdivision two that's, that's modified in the bill. Um, so the default is that this is public information. There simply is this exception right now that if the mother is not married, that then uh, there's uh, that then that is um, made confidential, and what this is, as uh, Mr. Kurtzaramo said, is then um, providing this particular uh, exemption uh, that an exception that can then um, provide the support for the family. So I just want to make sure that we're that we're clear on that. And with that, ready for questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Representative Pinto. Uh, Representative Scott. Madam Chair and Representative Pinto. Um, <clears throat> you know, I understand what you're trying to do here, but um, why don't why don't you just get the mother's consent um, to turn over this information? Uh, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Scott, thank you for the question. Um, and it's unfortunate because of the timing this has all worked um, because we had a parent, uh, a mother who's participating, uh, who wants to participate in the program, who testified in the Early Childhood Committee is not able to join us, but I have her um, her, her testimony in front of me, and perhaps we can even send it. Um, she is uh, uh, a mother who um, has uh, a couple kids, and she um, she has a, a baby that she wanted to have enrolled, um, and was excited to learn about this opportunity, but had to had to you know complete the paperwork and all, and found. Um, and I've even got. She said, um, "I had the college bound flyer taped onto my wall, in my bedroom. Every time I see it, I tell myself I'm going to do it. But there's always at least three other things I had to do first. I just change the diaper, wash the bottle, and then we've got a newborn involved, right? Something that always come up." And I didn't get around to enroll my baby um, to college bound. And so it's this challenge. Um, I don't maybe turn to Mr. Carcharamos regarding anything more on this, but I would found it really compelling the experience of this mom and other moms. Just do you think about what happens when you have a new baby? You've just got so much going on. Um, and so that's the challenge uh, of being able to have those records um, in that way regarding this particular um, exception that we have uh, under Minnesota law. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, well, I, I think maybe you might need to go back to the drawing board here and f find a way that when um, the moms are at the hospital to check a box on a form or something, because um, there's a reason that these are confidential records. And anytime we go playing with these birth records outside of current statute, it's it's really a sticky wicket. There are women that want and trust that confidentiality, and um, for them not to be able to give consent for for this information to be shared, I just I just don't think it's um, in. I don't want to say betraying their trust, but it could be in some cases betraying their trust, and so. I, I just, I have problems with this bill um, because of that. And um, I, I just, I'm not gonna be able to support it unless there's some way for those moms to give consent for that information to be shared. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Karcher Ramos, did you wanna to respond to that? Uh, Madam Chair and members, um, what we know about children's savings accounts is that uh, auto enrollment and you know having it early on um, does ensure you know sort of optimal participation you know in the program. Uh, families still do have the chance to you know opt out both on the birth record side and on uh, on the program side of things. So um, what we see here is sort of the overall sort of benefit you know for you know families in the city of St. Paul and really having access you know to to the program. Uh, thank you. And I, I've been notified that we had one other testifier that wasn't here initially, but uh, he is here now. And I want to make sure we get that public testimony um, first, and then we'll go to further committee discussion. Uh, Mr. Neumeister, if you could uh, unmute yourself, uh, identify yourself for the record, and then go ahead with your testimony. Madam Chair, my name is Rich Neumeister, and today I'm putting on my privacy advocate hat. I oppose the bill in its whole. It goes against the philosophy here in Minnesota that we respect people's privacy, particularly when it's held by the government, particularly a birth record, which is the most private of many sets of data for individuals. If you take a look at the current language, and I don't have it in front of me, I don't have the bill in front of me, but you'll see that the exceptions 
is very specific with very high priorities, child support, I believe for men care, there's like four or five different examples to do this for one entity so that you can say, oh, we got $50 waiting for you in the bank account. Hey, why don't you uh, participate in the program is not, I think, an appropriate way. And it's an, definitely a bad precedent. And I remind you how in Minnesota, we have had some strong fair information principles. And one of them, which we highly prize of, is there must be a way for individuals to prevent information about them that was obtained for one purpose from being used or made available for other purposes without their consent. So Madam Chair, members of the committee, for me, who's been active on these issues in our state for many years, this is a proposal that does not merit that exception for the consent. And it can be done, and but it's up to them whether to do it rather than just, you know, they can deal with some of the public data aspects of that may be on a birth certificate. But to get also private and confidential, I do have some concerns, at least with how I saw the reading of the amendment. So I just say no to the, to the bill. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I want to thank you very much for the few moments of your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next on the list, Representative Hollins. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you. Um, I thank you, Representative Pinto, for bringing this. So first of all, totally understand um, forgetting to do things when you have a newborn. My, my son is two, and I'm just now getting around to getting his birth certificate. So that just shows you like how difficult it is, right, when you have a newborn baby. So I'm very sympathetic to that. Um, the other thing I have to ask, so in this situation, we are just talking about unwed mothers whose information is private, right? Who the birth records are private, correct? Uh, Mr. Carter Ramos. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative, uh, mothers who are, are not married, correct? Okay. So I, I guess I, I guess I feel like the issue is getting a little conflated when we're talking about privacy rights of different individuals. Um, to me, this is a very archaic language and archaic statute that um, is sort of demonizing um, mothers who are unwed and those children that come from that situation, which I don't think is fair. And I don't think most people would recognize it as such. Um, I myself have a number of friends who are unwed and had children, and I don't think those children think of themselves as, you know, bastards or anything like that. They're just loved, wonderful children and deserve to have that $50 in their bank account for college savings later. Um, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much for clarifying. Um, I'm definitely in support of this bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Hollins. Next on the list is Representative Johnson. <laughs> Chair Becker, Finn, uh, Representative Pinto, I do have serious problems with this bill. Going through that, you're talking about the uh, unwed mothers. But there's more and a lot more to that. This is, uh, to me, what I'm reading. It's opening up sealed adoption birth records. I have, as an adoptee, I have a lot of serious issues with that. Those were our confidential records set up with the mother ahead of time. They're sealed for a reason. The city of St. Paul has no right to those records. If the adopted person wants to get that when they get the adopted and amended birth certificate, that is fine. That's a public record. But the sealed adoption records should never be touched. Thank you. Uh, response, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Madam Chair. And I might, if I can, I believe there's a, um, a staff member from the Department of Health who's on who's going to be available for any technical assistance. And I think that that person, um, uh, Ms. Crawford, may be able to comment about kind of how things work in terms of adoption issues. All right, uh, Ms. Crawford, please introduce yourself for the record, and then go ahead. Hi, I'm Molly Crawford. I'm the State Registrar with the Office of Vital Records at the Minnesota Department of Health. This bill does.
adoptee or adoption records in any way. Um, the conversation it is uh, true. Um, in Minnesota, births to unmarried mothers uh, default to a confidential birth record, meaning the civil registration and demographic information on that child's birth record would be considered confidential. The unmarried mother has the option at the time of birth when the record is being registered to choose to make the record public. Um, if she doesn't make a choice, it defaults to confidential. Married mothers, um, their children's birth records are automatically public. The health information on all birth records is private information and this bill does not uh, address or need health information. Um, the adoptee records are separate and they are addressed in a different part of the law. Uh, this bill would not allow us to share those sealed adoption records. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Crawford, for uh, clarifying that. Uh, next up on the list is Representative Herr. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Pinto, for bringing uh, this bill forward. Um, I actually had the fortunate um, uh, ability to have worked on this um, college savings account plan when it was developed uh, in the mayor's office. And, um, you know, to represent I mean, Scott's question about having hospitals be able to have uh, have forms to opt in that actually we've explored, we, they explored all of those other those options and that the operations of the way hospitals work, that they cannot do that. Um, and so there are there are uh, barriers to doing that. But that aside, um, you know, I just want to be very clear that when uh, the college savings account was looking to explore why the why married a child born to a, a married parent's record was public, but uh, if for a single mother it is not. That no one was able to explain why that was the case, except for that this is an antiquated law. It is not there to actually protect anybody's specific data for any reason, except for that back in the, the day, you know, when you there was a lot of shame around being a single mother. And so we looked at other states and that it was not consistent within other states, that it was separated this way as well. And that we were, uh, from what I can recall, was one of the few states that actually do uh, make single mother uh, birth data um, private. And so I just wanted to thank Representative Pinto for bringing light to this particular issue and ensuring that our children who are born to single moms have the exact same opportunity and the exact same chances to go to college as others, as children who are born to parents who are married. Um, I did just want to ask uh, um, Mr. Karcher Ramos uh, a really quick question around what is that when you uh, do an opt-in rate, what is the rate of uh, those parents actually opting in, even if they're given all of the information I would, I'm just curious to see the difference, uh, you know, what that rate is. Had, were you all able to collect that data? Uh, Mr. Karcher Ramos. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative, uh, we had about 400 uh, mothers opt in their, their child um, and still had another uh, 1,600 or so uh, who did not. Um, so I'm not sure the exact first percentage there, but approximately, I don't know, 15%, 12, 15% um, did opt in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Her. Madam Chair, thank you, Mr. Karcher Ramos, for that response. And I did just want to say that when we put these barriers in place for no reason, it makes it really challenging for children to get the support that they need. We already know there is an issue with the opportunity gap and the achievement gap and the, the ability to go to college and that this is a tool that's really important. I just wanted to confirm that I did look and there, we are one of the only states that do this and two other states have some similar, but it's not the same as ours. And so we are literally the last state that does this and that this is timely and it's time for us to make this change. Thank you, Everson Pinto for bringing this forward. Yeah, thank you, Representative Her. And, and I will note, I know a lot of uh, legislators actually use uh, birth data to send out congratulations letters to uh, constituents, and that comes from that public data. But uh, apparently it's only about the babies whose parents happen to be married. Um, next on the list is Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Pinto. Nice to see you. I wanted to talk more about the issue of who gets this. So in the bill, it says the entity administering the child savings program. So if you could tell me who that is, and then it, there's no guardrails around what they can use it for. It just says for opening the account. So once they open the account, then they 
destroy the data or it's not used for managing the account? Or if you could just explain more who's using it and what they can use it for. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Robbins, for getting us back to the bill. Uh, Representative Pinto. And thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I will direct that to Mr. Karcher Ramos, if I can, as the person who's kind of working directly with the program. Uh, Mr. Karcher Ramos. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, um, we have um, a sort of auto upload that comes from uh, the Department of Health right now. So we never actually get the file. It automatically goes into um, a secured uh, database. And from there, that is where um, uh, the, the family gets um, a mailing uh, to basically invite them uh, to join uh, the program. Um, so uh, the, the birth record information is only used uh, for uh, those outreach purposes. Uh, Follow-up, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, so I'm sorry, um, who, who actually is administering the program and when do they destroy the data after you send that outreach or once you create the account, then is the data destroyed or is it needed for ongoing administration of the program? Uh, Mr. Karcher Ramos. Uh, Madam Chair Representative, so um, in our situation, it is uh, a city staff member uh, who's the program manager. Uh, she has uh, access to the, the database. Um, and um, we don't use the data, you know, for any other reason in terms of data retention and, you know, that sort of thing. You know, it does remain um, in the database um, and, you know, follows sort of the, the data retention policies of, uh, of the city. Uh, all right. Uh, moving on to uh, Representative Scott, and then we'll uh, move on to the vote. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so... What I understood Ms. Ms. Crawford to say is that the mother has a choice to make the information about the birth of her child either confidential or public. She has that choice. If she chooses confidentiality, why would we want to go against her wishes for $50 in a bank account? Why would we want to do that? And Representative Pinto, there's, as Representative Robbins asked you, there's no guardrails around this data. There's no audit trail created. There's there's people that have a person that has access to that. There's no there's no uh, requirement in this bill that the data be deleted um, after the bank account is open. I don't understand why we'd want to take this choice away from a mom when she makes the decision upon the birth of her child. Maybe that child was conceived as rape. We don't know the circumstances. But the mom has made that choice. She's given a choice. She makes the decision. It's not our decision to come along and, and turn that on its head for a $50 bank account. I, I just, I can't believe what I'm hearing here. Um, I'm a no on this, this bill. All right, uh, Representative Her, real quick, and then we are gonna move on to the vote. Uh, it's been a long day for everybody. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to ask Representative Pinto uh, testify or, or person to answer the question of how many single mothers who have babies know that they can make that option, that choice to do that under birth certificate. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Mr. Karcher Ramos. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair Representative, um, most folks don't actually know um, that it is an option. The default option in the situation is that it's confidential and they're, they're unaware. Um, you know, that uh, they're choosing confidential or not confidential. All right, I, a lot, last last time, Representative Scott, we, we usually only let people talk once, but I, I understand. Out of respect, I respect understand to you, I respect you, I will, uh, one you. more time, Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. How does this testifier know that that, how do they know that? Are they there? I, I don't know how he would possibly know the answer to that question that, um, Representative Herr just asked. <laughs> All right, uh, closing words, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. Uh, I should have noted that uh, that I, I, in fact, worked on the uh, with the advisory group Representative Herr referenced a number of years ago. This is something that's really been worked on for for us for several years uh, in in figuring this out because, as has been alluded to, we have 
um, really a, a, an antiquated setup right now where some births are fully public and then other births we have this other situation. Um, we, uh, in, at some point, we probably should be looking more broadly at that issue. But in the meantime, we know that there's this opportunity where it's the very children um, who are least likely to be, uh, or most likely to have their moms be in a situation that I referenced by that testifier and our other committee um, in the most challenging situations. We want to make sure that they're going to be able to have, have this access. Um, and so um, uh, members really would encourage your, your support for this uh, and making sure that uh, we can get um, babies and kids off to a great start. Thanks so much. Thank you, Representative Pinto. Uh, with that, I renew my motion that House File 1942 be recommended to be placed on the general register. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker Finn. Aye. Representative Moeller. Aye. Representative Scott. No. Representative Feist. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Grossel, excused. Representative Hurd. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Johnson. No. Representative Liebling. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Mortensen. No. Representative Novotny. Novotny, no. Representative Farr. No. Representative Robbins. No. Representative Vang. Aye. And Representative Zhang? Aye. Perfect. And Representative Feist? Representative Liebling? Perfect. There are eight ayes and six nays. Uh, the motion prevails and House File 1492 is on its way to the General Register. Uh, thank you, Representative Pinto, and thank you to the testifiers. Uh, you, and Chair with members. that, um, Yep, thank you. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass the gavel uh, over one last time today uh, to Vice Chair Moeller since the last uh, bill on the agenda is mine. So Vice Chair Moeller, uh, the, the gavel is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm a little tired right now. I haven't had as much coffee you know, now as I had this morning. So <laughs> <laughs> um, members, the next bill is House File 1869. Chair Becker Finn, would you like to move your bill? Uh, Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I will move that House File 1869 be recommended to be placed on the general register. Uh, members, this bill is, if, if you're familiar with the Safe at Home program through the Office of the Secretary of State, uh, these are some updates to the Safe at Home program. And with that, I will pass it on to my testifier, uh, Sam Bonowitz from the Office of the Secretary of State. Very well, welcome to the committee, Sam Bonowitz. Uh, please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Chair and members, my name is Sam Bonowitz and I am the Director of Government Relations for the Office of the Secretary of State. Um, Safe at Home is our state's address confidentiality program for people with very high safety needs, people who fear for their safety, like victims of domestic violence and stalking, um, but also members of our law enforcement. Um, when people enroll, our office assigns them a St. Paul PO Box address that all public and private entities must accept and use as the person's real address. Um, it goes on their driver's license and anywhere that you or I would provide our address, Safe at Home participants provide their Safe at Home address. Um, Safe at Home assists participants by forwarding their mail to them, helping them with interactions with third parties who need to understand legal compliance, problems with third party stakeholders, um, and by helping participants understand how to use the Safe at Home address to stay safe. The idea being that for the vast majority of participants, only the Safe at Home office knows the participant's true address because most safe at home participants are crime and abuse victims. The use of this address allows them the ability to go about their daily life without having their true address accessible to the person that they fear. Um, there are very, very rare occasions when another government office may need to know a participant's address, such as when a participant purchases a home or when there is a requested social service that must be delivered in the particip participant's home. Um, and there are instances where a utility company needs to know a service address. The changes before you today will just improve upon the program's effectiveness for those who fear for their safety. This is um, largely the same as a, the same as the bill that was heard um, in the Judiciary Committee last year. Um, it is primarily technical and clarifying. It clarifies existing laws and definitions, such as the definition of mail for safe at home purposes. Um, it requires participants to submit a date of birth on their general notice so that government entities know um, which Sally Smith that they need to protect. It also allows participants who submit a notice to a government entity the ability to decide for themselves what information of theirs needs to be protected. 
each participant has a different circumstance and situations are very specific. Um, and this change allows participants to control who knows what and who shares what information um, and every person has their own uniquely tailored safety plan. This particular change has really been driven by local government entities with employees that need this flexibility to decide for themselves what is and is not private. Just as an example, employees with public facing jobs like county attorneys or probation officers may want their home addresses protected, um, but would not be able to fulfill their job duties if the fact that they're an employee of that government entity is protected. Um, it also clarifies that real property notices is not just a notice to the county recorder, um, but also applies to all property records held by a government entity, such as tax and assessment records. Um, I am here for any questions, and I believe there are two um, people from Hennepin County that are also available for questions, if you should have any. Thank you. And I don't uh, know that, uh, Chair becker you had other testifiers, but I believe Mr. Neumeister wanted to testify in this bill as well. So welcome again, Mr. Neumeister. Um, please introduce yourself one more time and go ahead. You are, are muted right now. All right, well, we're trying to figure that out. Why don't we go to member questions? Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And to the, um, is it uh, Ms. Bonowitz? I can't see the last part of your last name on the screen there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, after all these years, I'm wondering why now do you need the date of birth? Ms. Bonowitz. Chair members, that's a great question. Um, and it's really because the program is, is expanding. We're getting more people that have similar or same names and government entities need to be able to decipher which one um, they need to protect. And this was also driven largely by um, the local governments. And I think this, was, this might've been something that was um, driven in large part by Hennepin County. So someone from Hennepin County might be able to speak to this too. But, uh, Representative Scott, did you have any follow-up to that? No, I didn't. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Mr. Neumeister, are you able to try again here with your testimony? Um, is this in regards to the Secretary of State's bill? Yes, it is. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, the question I had was on the publications. Many people use... Hey, okay, wait, Mr. Neumeister, can you just introduce yourself one more time here for the uh, record? Madam Chair, for the record, my name is Rich Neumeister. In the first part of the Secretary of State's bill for public information, distributes public data, it, it has some questions about where they're narrowing or questioning about the use of the directories. Those are great pieces of information that many people in the public use. One of the things I've seen a trend for is less printing and telling people to go online, but the printed book is still important. And in any of these efforts, I just want to make sure that this language does not say that there will not be public, you know, printed directories available at the request of a citizen at the Secretary of State's office. I hope that they just print enough so people can get that paper copy if they want that one. I still use it. I know many other people still use the paper copy for themselves. Okay, thank you. Um, Chair Becker Finn, did you have any comments to that or did you want to um, call on one of your testifiers? Um, if, if one of the testifiers wants wants to take that, I'm not even sure which provision um, Mr. Neumeister was, was referring to. Um, I may be referring to the uh, underlying um, language as amended. It was uh, amended last night uh, in state government. And so now it's been narrowed just to the provisions regarding the safe at home program. And it looks like Chair Becker Finn that Ms. Bonowitz is nodding her head. So go right ahead. Chair yeah, members, I was going to say um, the exact same thing. I, that's from the introduced version, but that was amended out in committee yesterday. Uh, all right, very well. I don't see any other member hands up. So at this point, Chair Becker Finn renews her motion that House File 1869 be recommended to be placed on the general register and the clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker Finn. Aye. Representative Muller. 
Aye. Representative Scott? Aye. Representative Feist? Representative Frazier? Aye. Representative Grossel, excused. Representative Herr? Aye. Representative Hollins? Aye. Representative Johnson? Aye. Representative Liebling? Representative Long? Aye. Representative Mortensen? Representative Mortensen? Representative Novotny? Novotny, votes aye. Representative Farr? Aye. Representative Robbins? Aye. Representative Fang? Aye. And Representative Zhang? Aye. Representative Feist? Representative Liebling? Representative Mortensen? Aye. There are 14 ayes and no nays. There being 14 ayes, the motion prevails and House File 1869 is recommended to be placed on the general register. And members, we have finished our committee work uh, for today. Our next hearing will be at our regularly scheduled time next Tuesday and the agenda will be posted on the committee webpage. With that, members, the meeting is adjourned.